All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. And we send peace and blessings upon his final prophet, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and on his companions, family, and all those who follow the guidance until the last day. Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, and viewers of various satellite channels, I welcome you with the greetings of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. Under the patronage of His Highness Sheikh Ahmed bin Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum and organized by the Department of Tourism and Commerce Marketing Dubai, we welcome you again this year to the 10th edition and the second edition of the non Arabic language program under the slogan Imanan wa Aman, Faith and Security. And we extend our thanks to our sponsors, our gold sponsors, Al Nabuda Group. Dubai Islamic Bank, Itisilat, Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, and the General Directorate of Residency and Foreign Affairs, and our bronze sponsors, Dubai Airport Free Zone, Tamani, Reyes Holidays, and Dubai Customs, and our media sponsors, Sama Dubai. For question and answers after the lecture, please text on 055-650 Five two five five zero double five six five zero five two five five, and we'd like to bring to your attention for all of those who are filling in the questionnaire to ensure to be eligible for the prize draw that you fill in on the questionnaire your full name, at least three names, with your mobile number. And we'd also furthermore like to bring your attention to a new section that we have in the tent for the first time this year, which is called Kundai and the lady section, Kuni Da'iya, which translates as be a preacher. You will find this if you're leaving from the VIP entrance or the main entrance on the middle of the tent on the outside. And inside, you'll find bags that have books and CDs to give to your non-Muslim colleagues, friends or family in various languages such as English, Tagalog, Malayalam and Hindi. And in the lady section, they will find this on the entrance to the main tent. Moving on to our speaker. Abdurrahim Green was brought up as a Roman Catholic Christian and he accepted Islam in 1987. Since that time, he has been involved in letters others know and spreading the message of Islam and been given lectures all around the world. He is well known for his efforts at the renowned Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park, London and his appearances, many appearances on Peace TV, the Islam Channel, and BBC, as well as many other TV and radio stations. He is the director of DAWA of Mercy Mission International and the founder and chairman of the very unique IERA, the Islamic Education and Research Academy in the UK, which is an organization which is dedicated to bringing the message of Islam to those who have not yet to receive the message and yet to be Muslim. And with that, and to, with no further ado, I invite Brother Abdurrahim to the stage to begin today's lecture. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. It's beautiful to be here and we'd be like to begin. And Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'gfiru wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayati amalina. Man yahdihillahu fala mudillala wa man yudlil fala hadiyala وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. We would like to begin by praising Allah. We praise Him. We seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness. And we take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Anyone who Allah guides, no one can misguide. But whoever Allah leaves to go astray, no one can guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, is Abdullah. He is the worshiper of Allah and he is the messenger of Allah. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower his mercy, his blessings, 
and his forgiveness upon you in this blessed month of Ramadan. I would like to remind us, I would like to begin by reminding us what all of this is for. Why are we sitting here today? Why did I travel from London to Dubai in Ramadan? Why are you fasting in this heat? Why are you suffering? For what? Let's remind ourselves what it's all for. There is a place, my brothers and sisters, that is waiting for those righteous, believing servants of Allah. A place that is so beautiful. A place where there are things which no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind can even imagine. This is a place where there will be peace. No jealousy, no hatred, no envy, no rancor, no greed, no lust. None of the things that causes problems amongst human beings. It is a place of complete, perfect happiness where every moment will be more beautiful and more happy and more enjoyable than the moment that was from before it. This is a place whose soil, the soil is of musk. Whose pebbles are from precious stones. The trees of this place are made of gold and silver. Yet from these trees comes fruit, easy to reach and beautiful to eat. In this place, there are couches of silk and gold brocade, where its inhabitants will be served by youths of perpetual freshness like guarded pearls. This is a place where when you eat, you don't eat because you're hungry. When you drink, you don't drink because you're thirsty. You eat and drink out of pleasure, just for enjoyment. This is a place where there are companions, the Huralain, the wide-eyed, firm-breasted virgins of paradise who no man has seen, my brothers, no man has seen your hur, your wife in paradise, no man has seen. She has been created specifically for you, created by Allah especially. And she is so beautiful. She is so beautiful. She is so perfect. If one tear from her eye was to fall on this earth, the whole of this earth, just one tear, this earth would smell so sweet. Subhanallah. This is Jannah. This is paradise. And what are the places, the abode, the houses, the palaces? Think about this. Think about this. The tent, the tent of a person in paradise, just the tent, is a hollowed out pearl 60 miles wide, the tent. If that is the tent in Jannah, what is the palace in Jannah going to be like? If this is the tent, what is the palace going to be like? And there is no evil speech. There is no backbiting. There is no slandering. There is no gossiping. There is no lying, no cheating, no stealing. No, none of that in paradise. 
But what there will be in paradise are the angels greeting us. And the company of the righteous. Imagine. I want you to imagine this. Really imagine it in your mind's eye. Jannah. Paradise. This place. It exists. Allah has already created it and it is waiting for us. Imagine meeting the prophets. Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh. I'm really looking forward if Allah lets me get to Jannah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of us, for genital fardos, ameen. To meet Nuh alayhi salam. A man who gave da'wah to his people for 950 years. He struggled in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For 950 years. And only a handful of people. Some scholars say just 70 people became Muslim. Just 70. Even his own son did not accept his message. Where did he find the patience? His dawah. He called publicly, he called privately. He called secretly, he called openly. How did you do that, Nuh? Tell us about it. Tell us your dawah stories. And Ibrahim, alayhi salam, subhanallah, the khalil of Allah, the close friend of Allah, close friend of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. To meet him, to talk with him, to hear him talk about his life, about his dawah, about the challenges that he faced, how he stood in front of that tyrant, Nimrod, how he challenged his people and their worship of idols, and how he built the Kaaba with his son, Ismail, Subhanallah. And of course, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To be able to talk with the Messenger of Allah, whose sunnah we follow, whose deen we claim to be followers of. To meet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To talk with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abu Bakr. And Umar. And Uthman. And Ali. And Hassan and Hussein. And Abu Huraira. And Abdullah ibn Abbas. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And, and. Subhanallah. This is Jannah. Oh, that's not the end. Because all of this is nothing compared, compared to seeing the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To see the face of Allah. Subhanallah. It is the most beautiful thing in paradise. That we will be able to look upon the face of Allah. And you know what? The worst punishment in the hellfire, worse than the fire, worse than the tree of Zakum, worse than the boiling water that will scald the faces and burn the insides. The worst punishment in Jahannam is that the people in Jahannam will know that they will never be able to see the face of Allah. That's the worst punishment for them. And how long is this paradise, my brothers? How long will we be there in this paradise? A year? Five years? A weekend? Maybe a quick weekend break would be great, right? No, forever. They will stay there forever. 
forever and ever, for eternity in Jannah. Forever. This is what it is all for. This is what it is all about. But I have to give you some news. This is the good news. But I have to give you some more news. You may think it's bad news, but it's not. And we'll see hopefully why. The reality of Jannah is this. Jannah is surrounded by difficulties, hardships, trials, tests, and tribulations. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He created Jannah, He said to Jibreel, alayhi salam, O Jibreel, go to my paradise and tell me what you think. So Jibreel, he went to Jannah and he came back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, oh Allah, anybody who hears about this place, they will definitely enter into it. Then Allah surrounded paradise with difficulties and hardships and trials and tests. And then he said to Jibreel, now go and look at my paradise. And then Jibreel came back, he said, Allah, I am afraid nobody will enter into it. You see, Jannah is not for free. If we want Jannah, we have to work for Jannah. We have to struggle for Jannah. We have to make an effort. Now, some people may think that this is bad news. But actually, even it is not bad news. And I want you to think about something in your own life. Think about your own life. Most people, if you ask them, ask them, what will make you happy? Most people will say, and this is proven through so many surveys that have been carried out scientifically asking people what will make them happy most people say money if they don't say money they say something material and you look at these people in England a brother was asking me just now all the trouble in England right now what is it is it sectarian violence <laughs> I said no it's not sectarian violence these are people intoxicated with the love of the dunya. They are drunk with the love of the things of this world. They are people who have been indoctrinated. To run after the world and the things of the world. And to care about nothing else. And not to wait, not to work. They've been told you can have what you want. And you can have it now, today. And that's what they literally went and did. They took the opportunity and they saw it. To get what they want right now, today, with no work. Just smash and grab. This is what happens when you indoctrinate nations of people with nothing but mindless consumerism and love of this world. But the love of this world and the things of this world do not make people happy. And this has also been proven in survey after survey. Scientifically proven. The problem is this. When you acquire some worldly possession, you very soon become bored of it. It's what they call hedonistic entropy. Which basically means that you get bored of things that you enjoy very quickly. You buy a new car, very soon you're bored of the new car. The excitement of the new car wears off. After one month, one year, it wears off. And you see the latest model, you see the latest car, and you think, oh, oh I want that one now. Even, I don't know, they, I think I saw it here in the Emirates, right? I, there was an advert for a Blackberry, you know, tablet. And it said something like, yes, you should have waited. Meaning, oh, everyone's thinking, oh, if only I'd waited, I could have got this. What's the difference? 
between the iPad 1 and the iPad 2. This feature and that feature, yet they make you believe you can't live without the additional feature. If I have this one additional feature, this three megapixel more on my camera, yeah, this, you know, 0.2% transfer rate more, my life will be so much better, everything will be so much fantastic, but really it makes virtually no difference, and soon you are bored, and you want the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. It never makes you happy. You will never feel fulfilled. Whether it's money, cars, women, houses, horses, anything you can name it from this dunya, there always is something better. Always some other thing you're going to run after. Always some other thing you want to seek. You'll never find satisfaction in these things. Human beings, we, we don't. This is the fact. It's a fact. Yet most people imagine this is happiness. Relaxing, on the beach, watching movies. Not necessarily watching movies on the beach, I see it. Relaxing, on the beach, watching movies. Yeah, just, you know, relax. No. This is actually not true. What is very strange in some ways, and what now psychologists are beginning to discover about the human mind, is that in fact, the things that make us truly happy are often the things that are most difficult and involve effort and struggle. Because when we make an effort and when we struggle and when we commit ourselves to trying to achieve something, especially if at the end of this activity we feel that I have improved myself as a human being and I have contributed to the benefit of humanity even if it is in a small way. This is something that gives us a true, profound and lasting sense of happiness. And I know it doesn't take much imagination for you to realize this is exactly what Islam is saying. This is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been telling us. The true happiness is not in the world and the things of this world. That the things that truly last are good deeds. Not only because you will see the fruit of the good deeds in the akhirah. No, in this life, in this dunya, even in this life, the things that last are good deeds. Look back on your life, and I'm sure you can now, right now, in this room, look back on your life, and the things that will give you the most profound sense of happiness are the things you have done to help the poor, to help the needy, to look after your mother, your father, raising your children, doing something good, some activity that is profound, learning Quran, saying your prayers, fasting Ramadan, these are the things that have given you a lasting sense of happiness and worth that is with you until today. Long after you have forgotten about the toys you got when you were a child or the recent car or whatever those things you were so thought they were going to make your life so much better. But you've forgotten them. But the things that last, the things that stay with you are the things that you struggled, that have significance, that have purpose. So even, really, when we are told that Jannah is surrounded by hardships and difficulties and trials and tests, even as a Muslim, when we go through hardships and difficulties and trials and tests, it is good for us. It improves us. It improves our character. It makes us stronger. It makes us happier. As long, of course, as we have sabr. And this is a beautiful thing, my brothers and sisters in Islam. What a beautiful religion we have. And no one else has this. No one else. No religion has this except Islam. How do I know that? Because this is what the Prophet ﷺ said. What I'm going to say. How amazing, how wonderful is the condition of the believer. Everything that happens to them is good. Subhanallah. 
hear that again. Everything that happens to them is good. If they get some bounty, if they get some blessing from Allah, then they are grateful. They thank Allah. They are grateful. They use it in a halal way. And that is good for them. And if some difficulty or hardship occurs to them, even if it is a thorn that pricks your foot, even a thorn pricking your foot, that is good for you. That is good for you. And this is only for the believer. This is only for the believer. Subhanallah. So if we understand that true happiness in life comes from struggle, we believers should embrace the struggle. Let's accept it happily, willingly. Because this is the problem. The things that make you truly happy, they take an effort. And the big problem is that initial effort. The initial effort is what we have to overcome. But when you embrace the struggle, when you look forward to the struggle, when you realize that the struggle itself is what is going to make you truly profoundly happy, you accept it. You know that life is a test. You know that life is a test. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسُنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْأَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created the death and He created the life that He may see or He may know or He may make known which of you is best in conduct. And He is the mighty and He is the forgiving. So life is a test. Accept the struggle. And you will be successful. You will be happy in this dunya. And you will, inshallah, you will get paradise in the akhirah. Subhanallah. And this is the secret of understanding something that again may seem very strange. Allah tests the ones He loves. And the ones He loves the most... He tests the most. Now most people would say, if God loves me, He will make my life so easy. I will have lots of money. I will have everything easy. <laughs> you know, that's what people will think. In fact, there are many, many people, Christians. Many Christians, they think like this. This is what they think. The more easy my life is, this is a sign of God's favor. No. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah tests the ones He loves. And the ones He loves the most, He tests the most. So the people who were tested the most were the Prophets. Then the ones like them and the ones like them. So being tested is a sign of Allah's favor. Because if Allah tests you and you are patient, you will become a truly happy person. Allah is teaching you self-control. Allah is teaching you self-mastery. When you are the master of yourself, when you are the master of your desires, when you are in control of your inner condition, whatever happens around you will not affect you. It will not affect you. There is your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever happens around will not affect you. And this is how the Sahaba light used to be. The dunya was nothing to them. If they had it or they didn't have it, it made no difference. If it had it, alhamdulillah. If they didn't have it, alhamdulillah. Because the, their, the, their happiness was not connected to these externalities. Their happiness was an internal, in, inner condition. It's something inside. So how do you develop that internal condition? It's through being tested. Through learning self-control. Through learning self-mastery. This is the beauty of fasting. You know, it's an amazing thing. Fasting is an amazing thing. And what a beautiful example. This is our three most basic desires. To drink, to eat, and to have 
uh, conjugal relations. Very powerful, very strong, primoral desires, basic desires that motivate a human being. So what, what is hunger? What is hunger exactly? It's a very simple biological process. When your body is not receiving the nutrients that it needs, it sends chemicals start being sent in your body. They send chemicals, they send signals to your brain, and the feeling that you have in your mind, that's what we call hunger. It's just your body telling you, feed me, you, I need food. The same with thirst, I need to drink. But you, mashallah, you've done something amazing. You have decided not to accept those signals. You have decided consciously that I am going to ignore these signals being sent to my brain. This proves, by the way, you are not a creature of instinct. You are not an animal. You don't just behave according to whatever feelings come to you. No, you're learning control. Your mind is learning to override your passions, override your desires. You are learning self-control, self-mastery. No. And for what? Subhanallah, for something totally abstract. I'm not fasting, so I get a thousand pounds at the end of the day. <laughs> right? I'm not fasting, so I get a nice new house or a nice new car. No. I'm fasting to please Allah. Of course, for those of us who believe in Allah and know Allah, Allah is not abstract. But from the point of view of the people who are not Muslim, it's like, how do you do that? How do you not eat and drink the whole, how? And you just choose to do it, for, for what? What do, you, what do you get? They, they can't, it just doesn't compute. But this is a lesson in self And think about it. If you can fast in this heat and not drink and not eat for the whole day, really you can do anything. Anything you put your mind to. This is what Allah is teaching you. You do not have to let the world, your body, your own body, dictate how you behave. No, because you have niya, you have intention. Your intention focuses your behavior. You are what you think, brothers and sisters. You are what you think. What you think you become. What you think you become. And this is why we need to think a lot about Jannah. We need to think a lot about Annar. We need to think a lot about Qiyamah. We need to think a lot about paradise, the hellfire, the day of judgment, the reality of what is going to happen after we die. We need to think a lot about Allah. We need to think a lot about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because the more we think, the more we intend good, this is what our mind becomes preoccupied with. What you think you become. That's it. That's why if you listen to music and you watch movies, you become. You think money, 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 TV, 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 car, car, car. That's it. What you think you become. What you strive for, what you think about, you become it. It's that simple. So Ramadan is teaching us self-mastery and self-control. This is a test. This is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I want you to think, and this is something, subhanAllah, this is something, and I think maybe this is the first time I'm sharing it, so I'm going to share this, these thoughts I had. When I read this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about that Allah loves the one, the ones that Allah loves He tests, and the ones He loves the most, He tests the most. And I was thinking, you know those people, there are so many people, believers in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, du'at, call us to Islam, who have been taken and who have been tortured and terrible things that happened to them. Their nails pulled out, the, the, terrible things, tortured, beaten, humiliated, raped. 
so many stories and even these things are going on right until now. And I'm thinking, well, none of those things happened to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I mean, surely, I'm telling this is what's going on in my mind. Surely, you know, those things are much harder. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam wasn't tested like that. But actually, this is a misunderstanding of what the hardest test is. The hardest tests are not actually physical suffering. It's not. What were the prophets tested with? Let me tell you. They were tested with this. That Allah had given them knowledge. Allah had given them wahi, revelation. Knowledge from Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they went to share this gift, this blessing, this beautiful thing, this knowledge. They went to share this people, this knowledge with people. And they charged them nothing for it, for free. They went to call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To save them from destruction. To save them from the fire. To save them from the doom. To save them from misery in this life and in the next life. And they were called liars. They were called magicians. They were called fortune tellers. This is the hardest test of all. This is harder than being tortured. This is harder than physical torture and imprisonment. That you have this knowledge from Allah. And people call you a liar. They accuse you. You are a fundamentalist. You are an extremist. You are this and that. This is the hard test. And this is why the path of da'wah is the path of the prophets. Whoever is in the path of calling people to Islam is going to suffer some of this type of treatment. And this was the job of the messengers. That Allah tells us in the Quran that He did not send to any nation a messenger except that He called the people to worship Allah and abandon the worship of the false gods. This was the task of the messengers. This was their primary task and objective. To call the people away from the darkness of kufr to the light of Al-Islam. From the darkness of shirk, of making partners with God, of setting up rivals with God, to worshipping the one God, the Lord, the creator of the universe alone. This was the task of Nuh, of Ibrahim, of Musa, of Isa, of Muhammad. This was their job. Yet, you can be sure that there is nothing more satisfying, nothing that brings more satisfaction, a more profound and lasting sense of happiness than being a person who is calling to Allah. Because it is the most significant thing that you can do. It is the best way that you could ever help human beings is to save them from shirk, to save them from disbelief and bring them to the guidance of God, to the guidance of Allah. It is the most significant thing that you can do. And of course, to live by it yourself. You should not be a preacher who does not practice what they preach. So I am inviting you all, brothers and sisters, as mashallah, We've been told, become a caller to Islam. Definitely become a caller to Islam. But of course, first we need to call ourselves to Islam. We need to call ourselves to submit and to surrender to Allah. And one of the great lessons of this beautiful month of Ramadan is it teaches you how truly you are able to be in control of your own inner condition. How you can be a master of yourself.
so that you can be a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship Him truly and feel that profound sense of happiness. And then, and then, when we meet Allah, inshallah, we will enter that beautiful abode, that blessed place, Jannah, that we began to talk about this evening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us closer to the truth. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Jazakallah khair to Brother Abdurrahim for the very inspiring talk. We will now go to the questions, but before that, I would like to announce that after the questions, we have in the ladies' section four sisters who wish to embrace Islam. So once we have the questions done, we will do that, inshallah, over the microphone. The first question is asking Brother Abdurrahim, when and how and why did you accept Islam? Okay. My usual answer to this is go to YouTube and type in my name, how I came to Islam. You can listen to the whole lecture there, how I came to Islam. I've given the lecture of how I came to Islam so many times. I don't think I want to give that lecture anymore. But you can listen to it on YouTube. But very, very briefly, I will mention, I only really want to mention one thing. The most, the single most important thing in influencing me to become Muslim was reading a translation of the Quran. Having studied many religions, having been brought up a Catholic, having practiced Buddhism, having studied many religions, I spent years looking for the answers to life. Why am I here? What is the reason for our existence? What is going to happen to us when we die? What is life for? I found the answers to all of those questions in the Quran. It was the only book that I read that I felt certain that it was a book that was from Allah. And actually I remember very clearly the day that I was sitting on a train going from one part of London to another and I was reading the Quran I remember so distinctly I was reading this translation of the Quran I looked out of the window at that time I remember even I was going at that exact moment we were going over the Thames the river Thames and I looked back and I said if I have ever read a book that is from God this is the one and I, I think that is the moment that truly I surrendered myself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So very briefly, that's how I became Muslim. We have a second question. The question is, the questioner is asking, how can ladies and, and men, basically brothers and sisters, how can they become da'is or da'iyah? And what is the kind of material that you, you would recommend in giving da'wah? Okay. Every country has its own unique environment and situation. In the UK, we have started an organization which aims to be an international organization. So although we are based in the UK, we are launching in Canada this October. We're also going to be launching in Holland and France and Jamaica, uh, in Norway, uh, and inshallah soon in Africa as well. So we've only been going for two years, but things are moving very fast. But one of the things that we have realized is that a lot of dawa materials that we hand out is not really based upon sound research. A lot of it is someone who mashallah has some knowledge about Islam, some enthusiasm for dawa writes down their idea of what they think a good dawa book will be. And I'm sure that, you know, Ismail can vouch that some of the dawa materials that mashallah brothers with good intention have printed, you know, thousands and thousands of books and shipped them from the Middle East to England, 
but they were so unsuited. I mean, from the design of the cover, you know, designs that do not work in the, people will look at it and they will just put it away. They won't even open it because the design is not something that is appealing to them. Again, to the use of the words, the contents, the approach. You know, every country has its own unique situation. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do in our organization. We are, therefore, the research. One, research is key. Uh, we conducted a survey. This is a, what they call a statistically robust survey. And this is the, a scientific survey based upon the same type of scientific principles that, for example, psychologists and socioanalysts and sociologists will use to observe trends amongst societies and so on and so forth. So we use the same techniques. We hired professional companies uh, and we spent uh, a good amount of resources to actually discover what do English people really think about Islam? What really are their attitudes towards religion? And I just want to give you one example. In England, for example, this was perhaps the most shocking thing. And there were quite a few interesting statistics. If, you, if you're interested in reading it, by the way, you just need to go to our website, www.iera.org.uk, and you can download and read the whole research. But I just want to pinpoint a few interesting points that were raised. Number one, 70% of people, seven, more than 70% of people, when we ask them, how would you like to find out about religion? And we gave them some options. TV, radio, DVD, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, you know, whatever. Right? 70% said none of these. In fact, they said, we don't want to know about religion, even our own religion. We don't want to know. They don't want to know. So this was very important. And this matched some other research that we had come across that found that whenever you write a book or a leaflet, and this is, this is England, I'm not saying it's true in the Philippines or in Malawi or in England. If you have a book, for example, and on the book is written Islam, for example, if you put Jesus, a prophet of Islam, and you put it on the table, people will not touch it. It might as well be a bomb. The moment they see the word Islam, they don't want to touch it. But if you put the truth about Jesus, nearly everybody picks it up. This is proper research. By the way, this is the type of stuff that Christians have been doing and spending huge amounts of money on. I want to give you an example of one, just one Christian missionary organization. The name of this organization is called Campus Crusade for Christ. It's just one, and it's not even the biggest. This organization operates in 119 countries in the world. They have 25,000 full-time, full-paid missionaries, and 250,000, a quarter of a million volunteers. And here's the most shocking thing. Last year, they raised 670 million US dollars in one year. 670 million US dollars for their missionary work. And you know what they spent on aid? Helping the poor and the needy? 80 million. 80 million on aid, 670 million on their missionary work. Subhanallah, this is what they are doing. So we have looked at their models and looked at the way they're trying to do things and we're trying to see what, have, what techniques have they employed, what type of, of course, our sharia is not, our way is not their way. But if they are doing something that is effective and it is halal, we should look at it. And one of the things we find, they do this research. When they come to our countries, they will make sure, and Sheikh Ahmed Dida was pointing this out years ago. They will make sure their leaflets, you know, their book looks like a Quran. 
You think, mashallah, the, in, the true Injil. And you open it up and, you know, you will find, and they will, they will study the culture. They will say, okay, we shouldn't say this thing, we should say that thing. They maybe they will come dressed in a qutra and, uh, 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 and, and a thawb and, you know, and they think about all of these things. What is the best way to talk to the people? And we don't do these things, unfortunately. And they base it on research. It's not just guesswork. They spend a lot of money and invest a lot of money to do this research. So these are very, very important things. So when you say to me, what's the best way of giving dawah, as the person was asking, well, you know, how to give dawah in the Emirates may be very, very different how we give dawah in the UK. People here, I suspect, I don't know. Why don't you do some research? Do some research. Find out. Ask the non-Muslims who come here. What is their attitude to Islam after they've been for here for a year or two years or three years? I suspect they will be much, I think actually they will be very happy to get information about Islam. That's my, I suspect that. You may think, no, well, they don't want to know. I'm sure, I think most of them, they do want to know something. Right? So I think you may find very different attitudes. Allahu alam. So, however, I would like to say one thing. I still think that the best way of giving dawah is by one person talking to another person. It is so much, I mean, books are fantastic. Videos are great. YouTube is great. Satellite, it's all good. But the best thing is when one human being is talking to another human being. And so I do think we need to initiate programs. I would like to see every Muslim, every Muslim becoming a caller to Islam. To have good basic knowledge. And it doesn't take much. You don't need to be a scholar. But knowing how to have a dawah conversation. And actually this is the main thrust of our activity and our organization is just this one thing. Teaching people have, how to have a good dawah conversation. Because if every Muslim talk to their non-Muslim work colleagues, their non-Muslim friends, their non-Muslim neighbors, and they knew how to explain to Islam to them properly, I think this will be the best way to give dawah. And I am sure we will see very soon what the Prophet ﷺ said. Because the Prophet said, وسلم, Islam will enter every country, every city, every town, every village, every home, even a home of mud or hair, meaning a tent. There will be someone whom Allah will honor with the Quran or those who Allah will dishonor by them being away from the Quran. This means not that there will be a TV with information about Islam, no. There will be a Muslim in every house. Every house. It is going to happen. I think the question we need to ask today is, do we want to be part of making that happen? Do we want to get the ajr? Do we want to get the reward? Because I think the time is right. With mass media, with the media, with our ability to travel, the opportunity and the world is so open today. I think Dubai is an amazing example of that. You know, there are so, the opportunity is there. We just need to seize that opportunity, inshallah. Final question for this evening is, what is the most effective way to protect myself from sin or from sinning? What is the most effective way to protect yourself from sinning? Okay. I'm trying to think of one, I don't know if there's a most effective way to protect yourself from sinning is it needs multiple solutions. There is no one particular thing. But if I was going to focus on one thing, if I was going to focus on one thing, I would say that the most important thing to focus on is perfecting your salah. And when I say perfecting your salah, I don't mean spending hours and hours and hours studying. Do I point my finger? Do I shake my finger? Right? Yeah? 
Do I put my hands on my chest when I come up from ruku or do I leave them by my side? I'm not saying the fiqh from this point of view is not, it is important. But that I, when I say perfecting your salah, I don't mean spending hours and hours and days and days arguing and debating on these issues. No. When I say perfecting your salah, I mean the khushu' in your salah. That when you stand in front of Allah, you truly are standing in front of Allah and you have the mindset. Can you imagine if you were really standing in front of Allah, how would you be? How would your khushu' be? How attentive would you be? How frightened would you be? How terrified would you be? How awed would you be? How in love with the presence of Allah you would be? How you would hope for Allah's mercy? How you would be afraid of it? How would you be? Think about it. If you're truly in front of Allah. But actually, when you make salah, you are truly in front of Allah. Truly you are. And this is, we need to focus on this. If you, if you perfect your salah, so that when you are standing in your prayer, you are thinking of nothing except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this will be a most amazing, amazing anecdote and cure for your sins. Insha'Allah. JazakAllah khair. We would like to take this opportunity to invite all of you, especially the youth, to our Department of Tourism and Commerce Marketing Islamic Exhibition in the Heritage Area in Shindra, located next to the Heritage Village, which is called El Siraj. We have uh, the opportunity there to be able to give the message of Islam and the values of the UAE culture to many tourists. And we have several programs and dawah workshops as well on how to give dawah on, on a one-to-one -one basis. And you can get more information by either calling us on 04-3933-240, emailing us at info at l-siraj, so al-siraj.com, or by visiting our website, www.al-siraj.com. If the sisters are ready on their side with a microphone, Brother Abdurrahim will take them through the process of declaring their faith, inshallah. Are the sisters ready? Maybe we should ask if there's anyone else here who wants to take shahada. Of course, if there's anybody in the... Uh, anyone else, anyone here today wants to become Muslim? Here amongst the men? We have to ask anyone who's not Muslim? Okay, so we got the sisters then. So in that case, are the sisters ready on their side? Not yet. Okay, well, in the meantime, while the sisters are preparing, uh, we'd just like to inform that Brother Abdurrahim will have two more lectures here in the UAE. He will have a lecture tomorrow at the Al Manar Quran Center, Ramadan Majlis, after Tarawih prayer. And he will have also one in the Al Boom Tourist Village, courtesy of Jumeirah Islamic Learning Center, on the 15th after Tarawih. Um, they're ready now, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. So. Okay, so may, just say after me, I'm going to first say some words in Arabic and you can repeat them and then we'll say it in uh, English or I don't know what your language is, but uh, we'll just say it in Arabic to start with. Okay, so say after me, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I testify that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. And I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Allahu Akbar, you are now Muslim. Alhamdulillah. Ma sha Allah, alhamdulillah.